I'd like to introduce Roy Hunt, um, who will introduce our presentation today. Thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Paul Ortiz needs no introduction uh, without ILR, OCAN. Uh, he's one of our most faithful and certainly one of our most in demand speakers, uh, but remarkably um, versatile uh, because today he's going to be talking about victims and great expectations. And tomorrow is the last session of his oral history project in St. Augustine with uh, Mike Gannon and uh, David Coleman and, uh, and David Chalmers. Uh, so at the same time, uh, in the apron room tomorrow for that uh, presentation. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Paul is going to take us back 100 years or so um, <clears throat> and see what the expectations were at the time. So Paul, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Roy. Thank you again for inviting me back to Institute for Learning and Retirement, uh, ILR. It's always a great honor and privilege for me to, to work with you. My only regret is that I am not able to enjoy uh, the, that in-person lunch uh, with you all today. That's all, uh, always um, a wonderful uh, benefit of working with colleagues at OCAMIC. Um, but I wanted to, to kind of start also by um, acknowledging my dear friend and colleague, Richard McMaster, who I see is here. Uh, Richard has taken the heavy lifting to talk about a very important novel that comes out of um, Dickens's travels to, to the United States, of course, Martin Chuzzlewit, which is really an epic novel. And I'm just so glad, Richard, that you you know, are able to share your expertise with us about that extraordinarily important book of Dickens. Um, so thank you. I also wanted to um, just say a couple words about the film that I asked folks to kind of watch. If you haven't had the chance to, to screen it yet, that's fine. But I do, um, I did, you know, I watched that film, The Man Who Had Been in Christmas a number of years ago actually on an international flight, you know, how you go on, or maybe you used to do those long flights where the, the main benefit was the, the movie selection, right? And you have usually a broader movie selection. So I just saw this movie, you know, and I think it was Delta or something. And it was like the man who had been in Christmas. Well, that's, that's interesting. And it turned out it was about Charles Dickens and the steps he took uh, ramping up to write a Christmas Carol, and it begins with his trip. It kind of, it, it's a segue or a nod to his trip to the United States. He's on a stage. It's really kind of dramatic. There's jugglers and clowns and fireworks and things like that. Um, and at first, I thought, wow, this is really kind of a cheesy, kind of fun movie. And, the, and when I went back and rewatched it last week, I thought, you know, there's some real meaning here in this film, and I want to talk a little bit about that. In my presentation today, um, I usually do a disclaimer when I talk about novels, right? I, I usually start by saying, I'm not a literary scholar. I'm just a historian who likes to, to read books. Uh, this morning, I can, can dispense with that, that uh, caveat because we're not, of course, really talking about a novel. Uh, we're talking about a remarkable travel log uh, that Charles Dickens embarked upon. And remember, he's 29 years old when he makes this voyage uh, initially. And he's going to celebrate his 30th birthday in, in kind of midstream uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and I want us to think about uh, the impact that American notes will have on his writing. And not just, you know, the early, um, you know, kind of what have been referred to as the American novel or novels, but also leading up to A Christmas Carol. I and mean, we know that Charles Dickens always wrote with a conscience, with a social conscience. In recent decades, uh, scholars have been much more attuned to the impact of what it was like for him as a young boy at age 12 to see his father in, literally in prison for debt. And he at age 12 to go in and actually work in a boot blacking factory, Warren's factory. Um, and I'll talk about some of those issues and how they impact this journey. Uh, but I want us to kind of think about the early, early Dickens' life. But I want to begin with a letter 
reading for, uh, for you a letter, an excerpt from a letter that Dickens writes to the famous actor and very dear friend um, of Dickens, uh, a man by the name of William McReady. And Dickens writes this again, kind of midstream on his journey, his voyage in the United States. And I want to, uh, let me actually go to the shared screen because I will um, be able to, uh, I've, uh, we have found a map um, and And folks can see the, the map, Paul Parker, is that map showing up now? And Richard, you can see the, that map, it's showing up clearly? It's there. Excellent, thank you so much. So think about Dickens in kind of midstream, he's in, he's in Baltimore by now um, on the trip. And I'll share with you the URL um, that where I got this map from, it's a really good page. It's a really good resource for tracking Dickens' travels through the United States. And again, the letter to William McReady dated March 22nd, 1842. My dear McReady, I desire to be so honest and just to those who have so enthusiastically and earnestly welcomed me that I burn the last letter I wrote to you, even to you to whom I would speak as to myself rather than let it come with anything that might seem like an ill-considered word of disappointment. I prefer that you should think of me neglectful, if you can imagine anything so wild, rather than I should do wrong in this respect. Still, it is of no use. I am disappointed. This is not the Republic I came to see. This is not the Republic of my imagination. I infinitely prefer a liberal monarchy, even with its sickening accompaniments of court circulars to such a government as this. The more I think of its youth and strength, the poorer and more trifling in a thousand aspects it appears in my eyes. In everything in which it is made a boast, excepting its education of the people, and its care for poor children, it sinks immeasurably below the level I placed it upon. And England, even England, bad and faulty as that old land is, and miserable as millions of her people are, rises in comparison. You live here, McCree, as I have sometimes heard you imagine it. You loving you with all my heart and soul and knowing what your disposition really is, I would not condemn you to a year's residence on this side of the Atlantic for any money. Freedom of opinion, where is it? I see a press more mean and paltry and silly and disgraceful than any country I ever knew. If that is its standard, here it is. So this is Charles Dickens who comes to the United States in 1894, and he wants to write something which is positive, you know, which is admiring. Uh, he is a distant admirer of the United States of America. And, but he ends up writing something very different. He writes a book where there is deep admiration and respect for the people of the United States. Um, but he also writes some very incisive and in some cases devastating critiques. And so we want to kind of talk today to try to put together Dickens's experiences and to try to kind of figure out collectively how he ends up writing this remarkable book. And I just shared with you a few of the, the, uh, the original uh, front piece. Uh, American Notes has been published and republished on many occasions. Um, as you know by now, if you have the opportunity to read through what I think is a very fine Penguin Classics edition of American Notes, um, this is a book that uh, lost Dickens quite a few famous literary friends. Washington Irving, Irving especially was um, infuriated by the book and, and others were as well. Other people, though, responded to American Notes very differently. 
Um, and we wanna talk about some of those responses. We may get to some of those in the Q&A. But again, I want us, as we're thinking about the, the, the two novels, at least, Martin Chuzzlewit and, and Great Expectations, which we'll talk about next, next Monday, I want us to think about how this trip impacted Dickens, the writer. Because when I think about Dickens as a writer, I think about him, you know, Mark Twain comes to mind. Uh, James Baldwin comes to mind. Toni Morrison comes to mind. I think about the impact of experience on the writer. And the more we learn about Charles Dickens, the more we realize that, again, his early life experiences, especially with the, the intermittent poverty that he knew, that he experienced, uh, were, were pretty devastating on him. Uh, these were experiences that his biographer, John Forster, had encouraged him to kind of not highlight, and that he himself, as a writer, chose to kind of downplay. Uh, but after he passed away, certainly, and John Forster publishes the famous uh, biography of Dickens, the, the details begin to, to come out and begin to be manifest. You saw in the movie, The Man Who Been at uh, Christmas, the actor who I thought did a wonderful job of portraying uh, John Forster, maybe a bit lightly, uh, if you will. Forster was a very weighty uh, fellow. He attends one of the premier schools uh, in England, uh, to, which is today uh, still one of the premier uh, uh, top schools, public schools, as they call it there. Uh, Dickens and Forster, when, whenever we think of Dickens, we, we need to think of Forster because John Forster is a person who, who over time especially, uh, really um, is, becomes closer and closer to Dickens and really kind of jealously guards his, his public persona, uh, reads his manuscripts, um, begs Dickens to not publish the, the initial and the, the original introduction to this book and uh, to American Notes. And again, if you read the Penguin's classic version, you know that Forrester prevailed successfully upon Dickens. Please do not publish that introduction um, that you originally were going to use with American Notes uh, because it will just burn, you know, your, it'll just alienate you from your potential audience. And so that initial, that original introduction ends up um, uh, being added as an appendix to uh, later editions of American Notes. And I'll talk about that a bit later in the presentation. But again, think about Dickens and Forrester together as they are in that in the film. The film obviously took a lot of artistic license, but I think it captures the spirit of that relationship pretty well. In a later um, iteration of Dickens, and we, when we think about his popularity and his resonance and his impact on the development of American literature, um, Charles uh, Dickens and Herman Melville comes to mind just immediately. And when I was doing kind of research for this presentation, I was really delighted to find that in fact, yes, Herman Melville was profoundly impacted by reading, especially Dickens's Bleak House, and other publications, and I didn't realize this, I didn't know any of this before I did, the, did some research on this, that um, Harper's Magazine in its original iteration actually began by publishing uh, in serial form uh, uh, Dickens's works. That's the thing to think about too, as we kind of premiere next week's discussion about Great Expectations, Many of these Dickens, Dickens novels, certainly Great Expectations, are published not initially as a full novel, but in serial form. That is, they're published in journals or newspapers like Harper's. In some cases, Dickens used his own imprint to publish his novels chapter by chapter, piece by piece, as it were. The, the um, advantage to the writer of, do, of working with Harper's in this way is that you, be, you, you begin to get a sense of your audience, what's working, um, you know, uh, is this resonating? Is this story, do I need to change the trajectory of the story? That's kind of the advantage of, of writing in, in serial form for those of you uh, who have done that. Of course, Harper's um, starts a decade, almost a decade after American Notes, but I thought it was interesting to go back to the Harper's archive. I'm a I admit I'm a longtime subscriber to Harper's. I love it. The only English AP course I took, the only AP course I took in high school was English. And my instructor, Don Bidwell, 
insisted that we read Harper's. He said it was an outstanding example of the short form essay. If you wanted to learn how to be a good writer, you had to read Harper's, right? And so um, I find that it's rooted in this Dickens, Dickinson uh, or Dickens uh, kind of tradition. And again, the impact on Melville um, is, is pretty obvious and we can talk about that later. This is one of my all time favorite images in film or literature. And those of you who, uh, again, premiering ahead to next week, uh, this is a screenshot of the young Pip running through County Kent, Kent the Marshes, to the church, to lay flowers at his, at his parents' graveside. He will run into the infamous convict Magwitch, uh, who will have such a profound impact on his life. But I love this, this, this landscape because it's so evocative and it sets the stage for Charles Dickens' life and his work uh, running along. And remember, this is the, the part of the entrance to the Thames, one of the world's great rivers, an imperial river, as Dickens will emphasize to us. It's the gateway to Botany Bay, to Australia, to the, to the, really to the British Empire. And so there's a meaning behind that opening sequence of Pip running down this marsh. And also equally important, the gallows in the background and in the foreground. The gallows are always there, punishment, discipline, debtor's prisons. Um, these were gallows set up um, all along the, the shorelines. Uh, and initially they're often used to publicly hang pirates people who endanger uh, British shipping and trade, right? And then later they're also used to, to hang other individuals. But it's such a rich and powerful imagery. Uh, I love my, out of all, and many films have been made about Great Expectations, but my favorite still is that 1946 version. These are the remnants of the prison where Charles Dickens's uh, father was incarcerated for debt when he was 12. Um, I encourage us to continue to think about the impact of events that happen to us early in our lives. We have talked about this in line with especially, um, you know, Mark Twain, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. There's a reason that he, that the author spends so much time talking about children and the social consciousness of children, the impact of the adult's world on children. We've also talked earlier about Harper Lee, To Kill a Mockingbird. And what it means to put so much of the plot emphasis and so much of the, the philosophical um, um, experiences, if you will, on, on young children. Uh, again, we think ahead to, to Pip, obviously, in Great Expectations. But when we think about um, American Notes, we also think about the fact that Dickens is very concerned about the treatment and the lives of young people in the United States. He's very concerned about that. He goes directly to a number of institutions uh, where children um, are, uh, are living. Uh, this is a um, drawing, obviously, of the blacking, the Warren Blacking Factory, uh, where Dickens worked for about a year uh, under very tough conditions. Uh, it had, again, a very uh, major, um, I would say, devastating impact, uh, maybe for good and, and for ill uh, on Dickens. Um, a lot of the social consciousness in his writings will again come from his experiences. And I'm not saying that everyone who, who had to work under these conditions as a child will end up uh, writing about them in the way that Dickens did. Obviously that's not the case, but for Dickens, and I think this is why I like that film, The Man Who Invented Christmas so much, is it takes us directly to the blacking factory, right? It takes us where Dickens really, Dickens actually, returns to this blacking factory. Now it's shuttered and he's an adult and he has to face his own ghosts. He has to face his past. And that's really a critical part of, of the author's uh, voice. So when he comes to the United States, it's not surprising that he will spend a lot of time telling us about his feeling about these institutions that he's touring. And to me, the most impactful part of this book, this travelogue, if you will, uh, chapter nine was always impactful, right? The chapter on slavery and violence. That's one of the great 
chapters of all so, any social criticism I've read my entire life, and I've been reading social criticism for a long time. I would place chapter nine, the discussion on slavery, at the very apex of that's to me how you write social criticism. But in rereading the book and going back to it, it's this, it's these sequences on the Eastern Penitentiary, which are to me become the most profound part of the book. These are, I've used the term devastating. It's devastating to read this, is it not? If you really get into this part of the book, he's going into the Eastern Penitentiary and he's talking to prison reformers. He's talking to administrators who believe that they've come up with a much better way of rehabilitating. And that's the key thing because for most of American prison history, rehabilitation was not has, and has not been a major emphasis. It's generally been on the old European common law discipline and punished tradition. But this was supposed to be an exception. Eastern Penitentiary in Philadelphia was supposed to be a more humane way of dealing with incarcerated individuals and was supposed to help them um, rehabil get rehabilitated, uh, learn a craft, uh, uh, make some income if minimal, and then go back out into the world and have a full and thriving life. Dickens finds this is an absolute catastrophe. Uh, what happens to people in Eastern Penitentiary is that lives are ruined. People's morale is crushed. Um, and when and and I encourage you, if you haven't, just kind of reread those passages. These are some of the great passages in modern literature on the issue of prison reform. Uh, these are so heartfelt and so passionate. And again, I would argue they're connected to Dickens's own experience working in the Blacking Factory, even though technically the Blacking Factory, um, the, the shoe polish factory was not a prison. It was a place that Dickens experienced as really as an incarcerated 12 year old child. And I feel when he goes to Eastern Penitentiary uh, and he's, he's um, I think he's still 29 at that point, or 30th the oldest, right? That he has, it's almost as if he has flashbacks. And the imagery, the ghostly imagery, the, the, um, the, the metaphor about the, the, the chains, the ghost in the corner of the oh, room, I, mean, I think that will actually get us thinking about A Christmas Carol, right? And how Dickens conceives of his relationship to the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future. So again, think of that illustration. I put the illustration which appears in Forrester's Life of Dickens. But remember, that illustration of Dickens on the left at work in the shoe blacking factory doesn't appear during Dickens's lifetime. That appears post Dickens passing away uh, because that wasn't something that he chose to, to share um, with, with people per se. This was a piece of the introduction, which Forster uh, literally begs Dickens, and, and it's interesting, you can go through the correspondence here, um, but he's saying basically, do not put this in your introduction, man. Um, you will, if, you, if your goal is to have an audience for this work, don't put this in your introduction. And one of the things I think in retrospect that infuriates Washington Irving and others so much is that, I mean, Dickens has, is, and if you've had the chance to read American Notes, Dickens has a lot of good things and positive things and kind things to say about Americans at that point in American history. Um, and, and he does this uh, frequently, and we'll, we'll talk about a few of those sequences. But the thing he says, I think that infuriates most of the literate audience in the United States in 1842 is is in this introduction and it's that the united states if, if I'm, I'm not going to kind of read the whole excerpt here but basically um with all of the advantages that the united states has and it has a tremendous amount of, of natural advantages that other nations do not have she is far from being a model for the earth to copy she is far from being a model for the earth to copy and this will infuriate people from the left to the right for generations. 
this is one of the reasons why American Notes has a very ambivalent relationship to social criticism of the United States in general. Because it's cool to kind of say that the US is the best country on earth, um, or it's cool to critique the United States, but you have to preface it with, well, we still believe we're the best country on earth, right? Uh, but we do have some things to kind of clear up. That's not what Charles Dickens is saying here at all. He's saying, I really like parts of the United States. He has major props for higher education, for example. Um, he likes the way that our public institutions in some cases are, are evolving, but he says, this is not the model to copy, y'all. There's a lot of problems here and um, I'm very disappointed and I wanna share that disappointment with you. And so this is something for us to think about now because we're in a similar period in American history. We, yesterday I gave a presentation uh, to our colleagues at United, uh, uh, UCG, United Ch uh, Church of Gainesville. And we talked about this new, this, these new rules and legislation against critical race theory uh, in our schools. Uh, and the fact that our K through 12 teachers in Florida and other states are being told to back way off when you try to talk about things like racism or inequality, um, you're having to, to really um, uh, uh, basically silence yourself. We have teachers now who have contacted our faculty union and have said, look, we're afraid to even mention the date 1619 in our classrooms for fear of getting punished. Um, this is where I think American Notes is so timely and so very important for us to think about how we critique our society uh, to talk about the problems that we do have. Do we have the courage to do that? And do we have the courage to stand up uh, when people are penalized for critiquing the society? Obviously, Charles Dickens, incredibly privileged. He knows he's only gonna be in the United States for six months when he goes back home. Uh, he doesn't have to live with the repercussions uh, in, in most cases of this criticism. But imagine a eighth grade teacher in Florida who uh, needs to talk about slavery, imagine how many pressures that she or he uh, is under now, especially with this new legislation uh, against talking about uh, critical race theory. So I, I just wanted to kind of highlight for us the, the incredible timeliness of this book. Dickens was profoundly impacted um, he met a lot of remarkable individuals. Um, it's so fun as a historian, you can, if you have access to encyclopedias or Google search, uh, you could Google search this book for weeks. Uh, the character of Laura uh, Bridgman, a fascinating individual um, who Dickens meets and is profoundly impacted by. Um, he essentially lifts up for us Perkins Institute for the Blind as being an example, he really wants this book in some ways, in its positive senses, to be an example for his home country and to say to people in London and, and other parts of the, of the nation, this is something we sh can and should emulate. These are young people who are being um, treated with dignity uh, and respect. And they're dealing, and as Dickens would, would have used the term back then, they're dealing with with profound difficulties and infirmities in their lives, uh, and they're not being punished for them. They're actually being taught, they're being trained. Um, now, again, there's a debate on how effective these, these institutions were, uh, which is very important, but for Dickens, this was a great step forward. Perkins Institute for the Blind was a great step forward, and, and for him who had been institutionalized to see this, uh, in 1842 was really for him one of the high points of the trip. And I'd encourage you to read more about Laura Bridgman. She was really a remarkable uh, individual, is seen as a precursor in many ways to Helen Keller um, in terms of, of lifting these issues um, and really teaching uh, uh, the rest of us that people who are blind or who have other, uh, other of these back then called disabilities um, actually have tremendous amounts of things to contribute uh, and, and, and are superior in many ways to, to those of us who think we have all of our, our faculties. Diggins is also very um, positive about the young university system in the United States. He talks mainly about Harvard, of course, but he's also looking at other universities that are, again, 
many of them in their infancy, infancy uh, in, in, in this country. Um, and he's, he, he likes what he sees. And um, without being too biased, um, I agree with his assessment. Uh, because with all the challenges of our university system, uh, I think that that's safe to say that the U.S. university system today is one of the strong points of the United States of America. That is, people today come from all over the world to go to U.S. universities, and not just the University of Florida, by the way. And so it's important to think about how and why our system of higher education developed the way that it did to be you know, one of really, uh, one of the bulwarks of the, of the Republic. And again, uh, Diggins is very laudatory. Um, obviously he spends a lot of time in Cambridge. Um, he kind of is partial to Harvard, but again, I think he wants us to understand that the university system writ large is just more than, than Harvard University. Also again, getting back to Perkins Institute of the Blind and other institutions that Diggins takes a look at, he's trying to use his experiences in, in America to kind of poke his countrymen back home and to say that the way that the Americans are developing their public institutions is very important for us in the old country to look at. We have something to learn here. And again, it comes down to the way that Dickens sees people being treated. He sees there being a sense of dignity and respect offered towards children and the poor in America that is not being offered them in England. And if you've read David Copperfield and Bleak House, et cetera, et cetera, you know how important that is to Dickens. He doesn't see himself as a working class person, right? He's not a trade union leader. He's, um, he, he's involved only in kind of a secondary way with the char charter movement uh, in England, which is the struggle uh, in part for the English working class to win the right to vote, right? Um, but he's very concerned about the treatment. He's very concerned about the relationship between classes uh, and he's using his experiences in the United States in this, in this occasion to really prod his countrymen. We can do better. We can learn this from the Americans. Diggins misses a lot, obviously, on this trip. And I, there's a lot of things we could talk about. You can, you can kind of pepper me with questions during Q&A. Um, but when he goes to Lowell, this is where I see some of the shortcomings of the Diggins approach as a travel writer. Um, many critics have written about American notes, and that could be a whole other session, right? Many people kind of flash in on this sequence of, of Dickens going to Lowell. And remember, Lowell is world, is world famous. People come from all over the world to Lowell because it's seen as an early example of mass textile production. This is the engine of the Industrial Revolution. This is before steel. This is before auto. It starts in textiles. This is ground zero of the global industrial revolution. So what Dickens says here is very important, but he, he, he puts on airs here. He's like, well, you know, these women, they, um, they don't dress above their station. Okay, that's interesting, Charles. A little snobby there, are we? Um, they kind of do what they should be doing. Their employers uh, uh, work really well with them and have their best interests in mind. Um, but there's a lot more to the story and Lowell because Lowell, Diggins doesn't report this, but Lowell's the center of American labor radicalism. These women that Diggins is, is I think justly positive about are the leading radicals of the labor movement of the 1830s and 1840s. And again, you have to remember, this is before the rise of industrial unionism, the steel workers, the auto workers, the mine workers, right? Uh, Richard Trumka, the former president of the mine workers recently passed away. But if you, have, if you ask me as a labor historian in the 1830s and 1840s, where is the radical heart of the American labor movement? I would say Lowell, Massachusetts. And I think that Dickens misses this point. Um, if you read the excerpts of this, this is one of the incredible documents, by the way, in US labor history. It's a constitution of the Lowell Factory Girls Association. They wrote this themselves, those same workers we can imagine 
many of the same workers that Dickens sees in 1842 were authors of this remarkable document in which they're attacking the ungenerous, illiberal, and avaricious capitalists. And they're convinced that union is power, right? And that we, the undersigned residents of Lowell, moved by a love of honest industry and the expectation of a fair and liberal recompense. In other words, um, this is really an early powerful statement of labor radicalism that doesn't really fit into Dickens's conception of how society works. I think he wants middle class and kind of upper class people to treat poor people with dignity and respect, and that's important, but he doesn't quite understand the agency here of working class people, especially as they're organizing collectively, or it doesn't show up in his descriptions of his interactions with, with, with the, uh, the women factory workers in Lowell. When Dickens goes to DC, and I'll show you a little bit about, um, I'll, I'll give you the link to the document, which has a, a great kind of blow by blow account of his, of, of his journey. Um, he is horrified. Um, he's very disappointed. That would, disappoint, would be an understatement. Um, Dickens, by the way, is a big fan of John Quincy Adams. And John, and, and John Quincy Adams, I have to explain a little bit about what that means in the context of 1842. So remember that when Dickens is in Washington, DC, and he's observing from the visitor's gallery these, these proceedings, the US Congress has passed a law, which is known in colloquial terms as the gag rule, which forbids congressmen from even taking up anti-slavery petitions in Congress. This is why it's called the gag rule. John Quincy Adams had been president of the United States. And when Adams was president of the United States, of course, the son of John Adams, uh, the father of Charles Francis Adams, um, when John Quincy Adams was president, he does nothing against slavery. In, quite, in fact, quite the opposite. He sends Andrew Jackson to Florida to defend slavery's southeastern perimeter. And that becomes an infamous uh, event in American history called the First Seminole War, right? But years later, Diggins has lost his reelection bid and he goes back and he becomes a congressman and he becomes a pillar of fire against slavery and US imperialism. And no one has yet quite been able to figure this out John Quincy Adams has some really uh, excellent biographers, but they're all kind of scratching their heads as people were in the 1840s, because John Quincy Adams would give, get up in Congress and make these incredible speeches against US imperialism in Mexico, against US imperialism, against Native Americans, and, and against slavery. And Dickens um, uh, doesn't refer to Adams necessarily in print in American notes, but he alludes to him. In this, in this section. So I just wanted to let you know that John Quincy Adams is there in American Notes, even if he isn't um, named as an individual. But this is the kind of discourse that Dickens really admires. And I want us to imagine, um, I use this passage in African-American Latinx history of the United States. The first time I read it, I was in tears because I'm like, wow, someone in Congress got up and said this? Do not you as an Anglo-Saxon slave holding exterminator of Indians from the bottom of your soul, hate the Mexican Spaniard Indian, emancipator of slaves and abolisher of slavery. And do you think that your hatred is not with equal cordiality returned? In other words, white people, you suck. And I'm telling you this because I'm a white person, right? And he says, if you go to Mexico, don't go to Mexico today because people will laugh at you when you talk about liberty and equality. And when John Quincy Adams would get up and say these things, we don't have recordings, but we have transcriptions where his colleagues are shouting at him or cursing at him or telling him to shut the heck up. And he has the courage of his convictions to continue to be a pillar of, pillar of fire against slavery. But this is what Diggins is seeing. He's seeing this incredible titanic struggle in Washington, D.C. He sees a lot of corruption. Uh, he, as you know by now, he writes about it. He riffs off the declaration. This is another thing that really infuriated Washington Urban was he, he, he and, and he's the humorist, right? That's another element of Dickens I've underplayed so far. 
but I want us to remember he's always the humorist. And so even in this very incisive criticism of corruption and political debasement that he sees in DC, he's using, he's trying to use, he's trying to weave uh, here some level of levity, if that could be possible in talking about slavery, right? Because in that part, in that sequence, he's using the Declaration of Independence against us in many ways. He's saying, oh, you, oh, what is this Declaration of Independence? Uh, what does it actually empower here? Oh, it empowers slavery. Uh, and so again, this is something, this is a powerful, powerful critique of the society. It's not saying you're not living up to the Declaration of Independence. It's saying you're using the Declaration of Independence to promote slavery. It's a devastating, incisive analysis. Dickens was savagely attacked um, for generations. In fact, there was an attack in Harper's that happened years after he passed away um, uh, on, this, on this point. Dickens, like de Tocqueville and others who wrote travelogues, and this is a genre, you know, I think um, I really like the author's introduction to this. Many people had written travelogues about trips to the United States, you know, before, during, and after Dickens's trip. But the issue of freedom of speech is an ongoing crisis in this republic. I would argue it continues to be so to this day. So on the one hand, you have people um, touting the freedom of speech, but on the other hand, only freedom of speech of certain kinds, right? And remember you have the gag rule in Congress. You can't even take up an anti-slavery petition. Okay, it doesn't sound like free speech to me, but then even more seriously, uh, when you speak out against slavery, uh, whether you're in the South or in fact, even in many cases in the North, you will often be mobbed, you could be beaten, you could be blacklisted, you could be even murdered. The case of Elijah Lovejoy was foremost in the minds of, of the entire world uh, because his, the, the murder of him and the burning down of his printing press and the response of authorities to this, this horrific crime um, spoke volumes about the state of freedom of speech. De Tocqueville was, was horrified. And he, de Tocqueville even went as far as saying, yeah, y'all have freedom of speech as long as you have a powerful patron who could defend you. That's when you have freedom of speech. Uh, but if you don't have that, then in the United States, freedom of speech is more honored in the breach than it is in, in, uh, in reality. And so these were things that Dickens was, was thinking about. We kind of want to move towards um, wrapping up and getting us to think about some of the people that Dickens or, um, um, impacted, but also the kind of historical context of criticism about the United States um, during roughly the same time period. So we had a wonderful session a few summers ago on Moby Dick. Um, my argument about Moby Dick is it's a powerful critique, again, about the good, the bad, and the ugly of American society leading up to the Civil War. Um, but Melville used all of his novels to a certain extent um, to talk about these problems in American political culture. Uh, one of them was class oppression. He talks specifically about the oppression of, of the sailor um, in, in, the, in the American Navy, uh, but also in, in the American shipping in general, right? But he also talks about American imperialism, and he talks about European imperialism. And it isn't, you know, you're not used to hearing about, oh, Herman Melville, the American anti-imperialist, but it's there. Uh, Taipei is, is very powerful uh, sequences about the devastating impacts of European imperialism on people in what was then known as the Sandwich Islands or Tahiti or Hawaii. Um, and so those critiques are always there. Um, and in some cases, they're, they're powerfully leveled um, in, the, in, in the literary dimension. The critiques that Dickens also drew upon, um, I feel it's safe to say, were from the radical abolitionists. Although it's interesting that Dickens chooses not to talk about them, but the critiques of people like William Lloyd Garrison um, and other anti-slavery activists by this point, not just in the US, but even in England, and France and, other, and Mexico and other parts of the world, um, are already there. It's interesting that Dickens critiques slavery, um, but doesn't necessarily say I'm an abolitionist, okay? That's a very important kind of um, uh, literary move, uh, strategy kind of, if you will. 
Um, again, Melville, I just, uh, every, for me, as you know, by now, all roads lead back to Herman Melville at some point in this, and at this point of U.S. history, especially, uh, Melville is talking um, not just about whales, but he's talking about, uh, he uses the, the search for the white whale um, and this prelude to, to Moby Dick, White Jacket, which in some ways is maybe my favorite Melville, I have to admit this publicly, I love Moby Dick, we read it again this summer, but White Jacket is, is just, it packs so much of a punch. And again, it's a, it's a really incisive critique against corporal punishment uh, in, in, the, in the U.S. Navy. It's a very important moment in U.S. history, but it's another critique, right? And we know that Melville was impacted by, by Dickens. Um, Dickens met so many incredible people. Again, we could spend hours talking about them. One of them was Native American leader Peter Pitchlin, who was, who was very uh, well known for his time, uh, depicted as a very tragic character um, as part of a disappearing group of people. Now, this is another critique of American notes because Dickens, to his credit, talks about the expropriation. And you, you can tell that Dickens is like, wow, these Anglos are stealing a lot of things from Native American people. But his, his, so in other words, he puts that out there like any good socially conscious writer of the time with a conscience would do. But he still frames Native Americans, I believe, within this kind of vanishing, noble, savage, disappearing trope, okay? He's not suggesting that um, they can, uh, he's essentially saying they've been overpowered by the American Republic and they're, they're in a losing battle. They're just gonna get, keep getting moved out and out. Isn't that a tragic, terrible thing? Uh, but at a certain point, the battle is, is, is over, it's finished, right? So that would be my critique of Dickens. On the one hand, um, um, I think it's very important that he talks about these sequences of, of Anglo-Americans expropriating land and pushing uh, 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 and displacing Native Americans. But he's not sure what to do with that. It's kind of overwhelming to him. And so he kind of leaves it, leaves it kind of hanging. Um, it'll be interesting. I don't know if Peter Pitchman later visited Dickens. Dickens you know, invited him, but I don't know if that ever happened. Um, chapter nine, again, is brilliant. It's incisive. It's based upon anti-slavery uh, tracts, um, as the as the uh, the uh, introductory notes note, um, and it, it's what I think is so amazing about it is it it's obviously first and foremost critique about slavery. Um, the critique of the critique is that Dickens doesn't really have much to say about African Americans. He's not sure what to say about African Americans, so it isn't. I wouldn't call this an anti-racist critique as much as I would call it a critique, a, a really powerful critique against slavery. Um, obviously Dickens is taking, demolishing one after the other, all the arguments in favor of slavery. And I think doing them, you know, doing it in the context of the time pretty effectively, kind of dismantling all these arguments about, you know, slavery is a civilized school for civilization. But he also goes one step further. And I want to emphasize this isn't something that Dickens invented. He's drawing from critiques that already exist in American society. One of the main critiques of slavery was that it not only dehumanizes black people, the enslaved black people themselves, it also dehumanizes white people. And he seems to suggest that the problem with chronic violence, and these are critiques which are so timely. If you think about the age of Black Lives Matter, if you think about our debates about gun violence today, this is where chapter, I would, I would say, if you asked me, Paul, as a historian, give me a chapter to share with my reading group, we're interested in the issue of Black Lives Matter, question of gun violence, et cetera, et cetera. I would say, hey, chapter nine, slavery, Dickens American Notes, check it out, read it as a group. It's very powerful. It has a cumulative kind of impact on the reader, on the audience, the way that Dickens chooses the anecdotes to share with us about these kind of shocking incidents of violence. But again, I would argue that um, you'll find the same thing in Melville. You will find the same thing in Mark Twain. Now, Mark Twain is writing in kind of a generation later, uh, if you will, 
the Twain is also writing about the 1840s and 1850s uh, in many cases. And so as we move towards, towards a conclusion, again, Diggins arrives in the United States wanting to write something that's very different than what he ends up writing. Um, he wants to give major props to the American people. Uh, he has great interactions with, with a lot of people. Uh, of course, we know he hates tobacco chewing and spitting, right? Um, and he has some inter you know, very important things to say about public health, which I think are, are, are they not incredibly timely today? Um, but he wants his readers to understand that, that, that for the most part, um, the people that he interacts with here are affectionate, generous, open-hearted, hospitable, enthusiastic, good-humored, polite to women. Another thing very important to Dickens, uh, frank and cordial to strangers, anxious, anxious to oblige, uh, far less prejudiced than that they have been described to be. Frequently polished and refined, very seldom rude or disagreeable. So again, Dickens finds much to applaud in the American character. Of course, he's not a big fan of the American copyright laws or lack thereof. Uh, his works are being relentlessly plagiarized at that time or reprinted uh, without his permission and without him, without him being able to earn revenue to support his, his expanding family. So he has beef with that too, we, but we know that. And it's interesting to me that literary uh, folks seem to be very interested in that, in that um, uh, part of his career. So I think what I'll do now is kind of stop the share. Um, I do want to find this link as we're thinking about uh, questions or thoughts or comments, because I want to put this link in the chat bar. And this link will take you to that map. And it's kind of a fun way to go through the book and see how, and, and literally you, you can follow this page and follow Dickens's journey throughout the United States. Um, so anyway, thank you for your kind attention and, and patience. Um, and we'll open the floor for, um, and Julie, I think you're gonna help us um, Kind of facilitate the, the Q and A. Sure, I'm here in the Oak Room, and and I see a comment in our chat here. Paul, do you want to address that one first from Anne Marie? Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So the question about the Tok to is the Tocqueville's um, democracy in America, uh, which, if I understand, remember correctly, took a longer term, more optimistic view of what he saw in his American travels and Dickens. That's interesting because. You know, there's multiple volumes of de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, and you can read them. I'm going to look in the mirror right now and kind of cast a figure towards the American historical profession, because I think American historians have been guilty of kind of picking and choosing what they want out of de Tocqueville. Um, because de Tocqueville, again, like Dickens, has some very positive things to say. Um, and democracy in America. And those are the things that generally ended up in the textbooks I read in college were the positive things. But then one of my mentors um, in college said, hey, have you read the second volume? Have you read, the, you know, and I'm like, wow, you know, de Tocqueville had some pretty devastating things to say about the nation's treatment of Native Americans, you know, slavery. Again, his critique of, of the freedom of speech in the US is very insightful. I'm not saying that, um, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is how can a travel log travel forward in time and continue to be timely? And that's where I think both de Tocqueville and Dickens are timely as long as we read them in their entirety, right? I mean, like we could have spent a whole session talking about how Dickens like, you know, trashed the United States. And a lot of the critiques of Dickens's American notes start on that level. They're like, well, Dickens didn't understand politics. He should have, he should have stayed with Christmas. You know, he should have blah, blah, blah. Um, but the question of, of how a book stays in print and why people continue to read it, it's got to have some staying power. It's, it can't just be all bad or all good, I guess, in terms of the of the criticism, it has to, it, I'm not saying that it has to be somewhere in between because there's parts of America that Dickens loves. Perkins Institute of the Blind is something that has a profound impact on him. 
um, he takes great heart in the way that the people who live there, the residents like Lord Bridgman are being uh, treated and trained and, and, and tra again, treated with dignity. Uh, to him, it's, it's a beautiful aspect of this culture. Uh, he loves our universities, right? There's no like, oh, they're, they're kind of okay. He loves them. But if there's an aspect of American life that he finds a group criticism of, he goes all the way, right? And that's what I think we find a little bit um, discomforting sometimes when we read American notes. Nothing speechless here in our home room. Oh. And Paul, I was going to ask if you wouldn't mind sending me that link by email, then I can forward it as well out to everyone. Yeah. And I apologize for our next week's session and Great Expectations. I'm going to, I have a, a page of resources um, on Dickens. Stanford University has an outstanding Charles Dickens um, kind of program. And there's, there's actually a, um, I should have done this today, actually. If you go to the Stanford University Dickens project, you'll find that they actually have a whole section where you can walk through great expectations chapter by chapter. And there's some nice annotations about some of the period um, events or uh, things that Dickens talks about, which are kind of unfamiliar to our own times. University of California, Santa Cruz, where I taught at for many years, also has a Dickens page resource, which is really good. Um, but I'll get those to folks for next week. Paul Parker, I see that you're unmuted. Do you have any comments? Who? Paul, did you have a comment? Paul, me? Yes, I saw that you oh, were muted. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm curious, and I, I, I suspect I already know the answer, but I may not, is that uh, there was no contact between, or, you know, meetings between Karl Marx and Dickens and Melville and these writers who were beginning to have a social conscience. I'd, I'd be interested if I'm wrong and whether they were even aware of one another in terms of uh, making these kinds of criticisms. Uh, Marx lived in New York for a period. I don't know that it's exactly the same time, but it's around the same time. I suspect they never met, but I wonder if they were, uh, he was aware and they were aware of some of his criticisms. Well, that's a good question, Paul. So yeah, you're right. They weren't, uh, your suspicion is, is correct. They, they were not in the same kind of space we do know that Melville talks in his in in some of the private correspondence has been found, and it's but the, the, the Harper's material is interesting. We do know that Melville was impacted in a major way by Dickens's writings. Um, the connection to Karl Marx is is not apparent or known, or I, I don't think that happens. But I'll tell you though that a later generation, and I forgot to mention this in terms of social criticism. A later generation of, of colonial subjects, people from Trinidad, people from uh, Barbados, people from uh, India, from other parts of the British Empire, will testify to something that's very fascinating about Charles Dickens. Um, because they had to read Dickens, and the, I'm talking about like the elites of the local colonized populations who would go to places like a, the, the equivalent of Queens Royal College uh, in, in say Port of Spain, Trinidad under British rule, they would be required to read Charles Dickens. Uh, mm -hmm. The same thing in India, the same thing in other parts of the empire uh, yeah. that, that the British controlled. So they read Dickens in the, in the tens and the twenties and the thirties. And what CLR James, probably the foremost of all of those anti-colonial figures of, of, of revolutionary uh, revolutionaries against the British Empire said was it was Dickens that turned us to Marx to Karl Marx. Why was yeah. that? James yeah. said that we that James says, look, I started reading Dickens decades yeah. after he wrote about capitalism in London, and if capitalism couldn't resolve its contradictions 40, 50, 80 years down the road, then um, 
that's why Dickens for them was such an important writer, okay? Because when they read Dickens' critiques of economic system in London in the 1840s, and now they're reading 50, 60, 70 years down the road, and when they, especially when James and others start migrating from Trinidad or from India to the so-called mother country in London, and they see the same poverty and the same displacement and the same level of, of, of class hostility, they're like, wow, maybe the system can't reform itself. And so yeah. James says, yeah, it was, it was Dickens who really turned many of us radical. Um, the same kind of impact. Dickens has an enormous impact on people in Eastern Europe after World War II. A lot of the people who will form um, the, the social movements against um, the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe talk about Dickens as being um, an inspiration to, to them. So Dickens is, is, continues to be a kind of a global kind of inspiration uh, for that social consciousness, which isn't, maybe it isn't as political as some of us would like. It's, it, in other words, again, his critique of slavery is there, but he doesn't talk about abolitionism per se, but maybe that's what he needed to do. Maybe, maybe going a step further was not the thing for Charles Dickens to do. That was for William Lloyd Garrison or Harriet Tubman, or Frederick Douglass, right? Or, yeah. The, so, yeah. Well, the uh, uh, West Indies, the British West Indies, uh, freed slaves in what, the 1830s. So I wonder whether uh, he was, uh, or their writings were impactful on, on the uh, change of, or the movement towards abolition that was certainly in Britain and then spread to the to the Caribbean and other places where they had had slaves. It seemed to me if, if they were writing these sorts of things that that had to get into the mix somehow. Uh, as you say, in the Caribbean, it began to influence people. Uh, I would assume it, their anti-slave uh, abolition uh, policies or ideas would have already uh, hit Britain's movement yeah. towards abolition. Well, Paul, that's that's a good point. And by this point, and Diggins does refer to this in his correspondence of the time, and he it's a kind of a muted reference. You have to know the history to understand kind of the, the, the references, but there's huge controversies between the United States and Great Britain at this time because the British actually have a small um, fleet of, ship, of, of of British naval ships from Majesty's vessels who are going to the Americas and, and actually stopping and boarding uh, slave ships um, that are bound for Cuba and interdicting those. And, and some of those plantations that those ships are on their way to, to sell people to are owned by guess who? Us, Us Americans. Yeah, right. right. And so Diggins does refer to this. This is beef, you know, this is the, the this is kind of the, the wicked aspect of the Monroe Doctrine. So yeah, there's a lot of controversies in, in 1842 between the United States and Great Britain over um, over slavery. Lynn, hold, I see you have your hand up. Is that yes, I, I do. Thank you, Paul. That was really an excellent presentation. Yes. A question about the second visit that he made in 1867, I think it was. Um, could you comment on what changed in his perceptions between the two visits? Uh, and this is after the Civil War, so. Yeah, well, Lynn, I think you nailed it right there. I mean, that was a big, um, and it's interesting that Dickens, it's interesting to me when I read about the different um, statements, because Dickens, after 1842, writes a number of updated introductions or prefaces to American notes. And he essentially says the same thing over and over again. And I'm not sure people believe him, but I think if someone writes something, you know, 10, 15 times, I'm going to kind of believe them, which is that he's like, hey, you know, I don't hate people in the United States. I just want to let people know that. And it's very poignant to me to see Dickens saying that over and over again. He's like, you know, I have a critique, you know, critiques of the country, but look, I don't hate the people. In fact, most of the people I really, quite frankly, love. But I think it's the abolition of slavery that frees Dickens and many people in Latin America 
in Europe especially to begin to have a different idea uh, and opinion of people in the United States. And I know from Mexico and parts of South America, people are, there's such a relief about the end of the Civil War in the United States that I think this clears the way for Dickens, although he doesn't want to gloat. That's important to remember. People, and I've read some criticism and people are like, well, why doesn't he talk about, you know, abolition as well? Hey, the U.S. just underwent the most bloody civil war in human history up to that point. So I, as a writer, do not gloat. Uh, you, know, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Um, people expected him to say more, but he just sa says, I really like the changes. Um, you do the math. About what the about what the changes are because he doesn't really point to other things, um, uh, but it's really I think um, the abolition of slavery. People are still plagiarizing him; they're still reprinting his works without any authorization whatsoever. That hasn't changed, certainly. Uh, of course, it's a very different climate now, right, with the U.S. and copyright infringement law. But but back then it was still very, you know, very kind of loose and, and wild. But Lynn, does that kind of get to your? Question, I, w I wish a lot of these questions, the best questions don't have clear cut answers, right? We can just kind of use our imagination to kind of respond to them. Any other questions? Oh, I have one here in the, in the Oak Room Hall, one moment. How many people are in the Oak Room, by the way? I'm not taking role or anything, but I'm just kind of curious. Uh, I wish ten, I could be there. 10 people here. Oh, oh, very good, very good. Well, 10 until Roy left us, but he had to hold up my book. Oh, hi, Paula. This is Alice Friedman here. Uh, just a couple of quick things. Number one, we owe you more than just the luncheon. And, <laughs> and the other thing is uh, the comment that was made about the despicable trickery, and that is very applicable to the politics that we have been living through for the last four or five years. And um, it not only deprived us um, of the, the vote that we wanted, but it deprived us of a very, very good candidate right here in Larchwood County. But I, I want to thank you again for, uh, for what you covered today, because it was very helpful. Did you thank you. Yeah, I mean, unless, unless there are any other questions here in chat or by Zoom participants. All right, well, Paul, I know Roy would thank you very much for being with us for this session. Mm -hmm. Nice hand here. And we'll look forward to next week's session with Paul Ortiz. Stay well, everyone. All right, Paul? thank you, everyone. Paul. Yes. Uh, I've got two. Uh, very 